Let's do this thing. All right. Hope you had a great long weekend. I did not mark your tests. I didn't finish. I worked on them, but I didn't finish. Um, once I'm done, though, I'll post your grades on Moodle. So you'll have your grades as soon as they exist. And that's how you'll know. And then I'll hand them back the following class whenever that is. Okay, so you, you do get your test back. I do, I'll, I'll post the solutions uh, and then you can use them to study for the final exam. So, uh, and I do write little notes in there. So it's worth picking them up. Usually I'm trying to force them back on people because I've spent so much time writing in them or it feels like it. Uh, now, let's see here. I want to get to the good part of this course, but Emily's been so good already. How could it possibly get any better? Well, it's about to. So uh, today, uh, what I've decided to do, or what I did rather, was you did the test and we kind of cut it a little bit short. That's okay. Uh, here, we did kind of talk about the binomial and, and we got through the binomial, but just very briefly. And so then we talked about the test one. We didn't do the negative binomial and, and I'm gonna cut it. I can't draw on here cause it's just on Moodle, but uh, I'll put a strike through. It says brief, but we're not even gonna touch on it. And then um, what I've decided to do for the Poisson is, uh, I think I've mentioned it before, but we're not gonna do it in class, but I did post this bonus assignment, which will kind of walk you through a video that I found. And he does it like way more concise than I ever could. And so, uh, and then it'll pause and ask you to answer some questions. <laughs> and how you can use that is to boost your assignment grade. So you don't have to do it. If you get a zero on it by not doing it, uh, it'll just drop that assignment grade, obviously, but it'll, it's set to now drop your lowest assignment grade. So if you do this one and it's better than a different assignment, then it'll replace it. Right. And we'll have a, I think, one or two more bonus assignments. So I do like to kind of give you some, some bonus opportunities. Okay. Uh, and so that's why it's called bonus assignment one. And then as I was setting this up just now, I realized I still had this week hidden, but let's start chapter five. Chapter five is where we start the meat and potatoes of this course, kind of the, the fun part, in my opinion, um, which is inference. Huh? Now we've talked about inference in terms of um, the word. Huh? But inference is going to be when we use sample information to learn about the population, which is what statistics is all about. Okay. So when we use sample information, sample information is called a statistic right? Something collected and measured from a sample. So when we use sample information or a statistic to learn or rather infer about the population. The parameter. So this is inference, right? We're taking sample information and we're inferring something about the population. Okay? But this is also kind of broad strokes statistics in general. There's lots of different fields, but this is definitely my favorite part and the most useful part. And I like to call it the moneymaker. If you can do inference, then that's where the money is. Okay. Tell us more about that. Well, if you want to prove that drug A is significantly better than drug B, 
What does that involve? Taking samples, right? Clinical trials, and then taking that sample information and inferring something about the population of these drugs, right? And then, but that, that movement of, from sample information to the general statement about the population, that's inference and that's statistics and that's where you can make a lot of money. It's not all about the money, but it helps, doesn't it? So before we can do any inference, which we are going to work through, and I can't remember if I, I did keep it. Okay, so um, we're gonna work through a number of different scenarios for inference, okay? Uh, but before we can do that in section 5.1, we have to establish some of the, the ideas about point estimates and sampling variability before we can move on, okay? But, and I kept this in here because I was so lazy, but going way, 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 way back to chapter one, right? Very first day, I think, uh, we said, okay, I've got a variable. A variable is either categorical or numerical, right? We've got a good handle on that, okay? Now, what type of variable we have is going to determine how we're gonna analyze this thing, okay? And so for a categorical variable, which is where we're going to start, we analyze proportions. We might just have a single proportion, right? Did more than 50% vote in favor of this candidate, right? Significantly more, right? Those are the questions that we're gonna answer, okay? We spend a lot of time establishing kind of the, the rules of the game in chapter five, okay? Because what's really nice is even though chapter five is going to feel like kind of a slog because it's all new uh, and it's a lot of rules, it is admittedly, uh, but it's like learning a new board game. Just got to learn the rules. But then once you know those rules, you can play the game. Okay. And then in 6.1, we're going to talk more about one sample proportion and then we build up in 6.2 to two sample proportions. Now I have proportions from two groups. How do they compare to each other, right? Is one significantly higher than the other one, okay? That's obviously more interested than interesting than one sample to a number, right? And then in 6.3, and I, I'm gonna add 6.4 here, it's, three or more proportions. So then we can look at all those different scenarios. If we have a numerical variable, then we're going to be analyzing the means, right? So if I'm analyzing the average, right? The average time it takes me to get to work, for example, right? The average revenue of a store, that kind of thing, right? Then we do, we move through the same motions. We're gonna walk, walk through, okay, how do I compare one sample mean? So an average to a number, right? I just need some benchmark that I wanna compare my average to. And then we move into two different scenarios of two sample means, kind of fun, uh, in 7.2 and 7.3. And then I'm gonna cut three or more means, but I'll make it a bonus assignment. How about that? Just so you can see it if you want to, but we're not gonna test you on it. Okay. Or I'm not, made it sound like there's more than one person involved. It's just me making decisions. Okay. So all of these, I'm going to refer to as types of questions, right? So the first thing that you're gonna to need to do when you read a question is figure out what type of question this is, okay? That I will say is the hardest part. It's hands down the hardest part of answering these questions. But once you have the type, then 
if you said, okay, this is a one sample proportion type of question, then this is where you are on your formula sheet, right? Oh, and I forgot to grab some, but hopefully you all have a, a copy of the formula sheet. I'll start bringing them again, but I forgot. If you've decided you have a two sample proportion question, then you're here. Uh oh, don't look too closely. It's kind of messy. Yikes. But we'll pick through it. It's all to help you out. If you have three or more, you're in one of these sections. And instead of a full table, I printed out a, a little mini version of a table. And then same thing, you have a one sample mean question or you have paired data. So two samples, but they're paired okay. or two sample means. So now they're just two independent samples. Yeah. And then we're into regression and that's the end of the course. All right, I know, keep it coming, Emily. I know we will. And so for a good long while now, we're gonna just chip away at all these different types of questions, right? And we start with one sample proportion. And what we're gonna find is the major players are going to be a confidence interval and a hypothesis test, okay? So inference is either a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. We don't know what those are yet, but if you take a sneak peek, right, there's a confidence interval, a hypothesis test. Okay, for chi-squared, there's only a hypothesis test, which sounds mean now, but you're gonna like it later. Confidence interval, hypothesis test. All right, so once you learn the rules for a confidence interval and a hypothesis test, then you can play the game for all these different types. Okay. So that's nice. But it's going to take a little bit of work to get there, isn't it? Okay. I guess I had it here. No original thoughts, I guess. Uh, so inference is when we take sample information to infer or learn something about the population. So we're going to talk about a confidence interval. Now, in kind of broad strokes, a confidence interval builds a plausible. This says plausible. Did that help? Maybe. A reasonable range for this parameter. Right. So I have a sample proportion, but I understand if I take a brand new sample, I, my proportion would change slightly, right? But I'm expecting it to kind of hover around some spot, right? And so when we build a confidence interval, we just build an interval around my estimate to try to capture the population proportion, for example. Yeah. Hypothesis testing is a more formal version and that this is where the money is, right? The formal testing of significance. Okay. So hypothesis testing, we test whether a sample reasonably came from the hypothesized population. That doesn't mean anything to us right now, but it will. Yeah. Can you imagine if we got to watch videos? So nice, turn the lights out. Here, watch a video. I only say that because they're clearly watching a video. I think. <clears throat> okay. So what we need is this concept of parameter estimation. Okay. And so uh, we're interested in population parameters. Right. But we understand that we'll never be able to capture the entire population and we don't need to, right? And so what we do is we use sample statistics, 
as point estimates. So sample statistics are going to be our best guess, our best guess at the parameter. We're gonna call them point estimates in general because the point estimate can be just one proportion, it can be one mean, it can be a difference in means, it can be a difference in proportions, and it can be any one of those things that we want. Yeah. But the problem is that when we're dealing with sample statistics, they're gonna vary from sample to sample, right? If I collected a new sample, right, it's voting season, and so of course, Right, there's gonna be a lot of uh, polling going on. Who are you gonna vote for, right? And so that's how they get those um, predictions that they announce on the news and on the radio and stuff like that, right? We understand that those predictions are not necessarily representative of the population, but they're our best guess at what the population looks like at that time. And so if I take a, a random sample of 100 people on campus, over 18, let's say, because you have to be able to vote, and I ask, who are you going to vote for? You say, Emily, buzz off. That's none of your business. And you tell me anyways, I guess. Uh, Felix the cat. Is Felix still around? The campus cat. He's around, right? Yes. OK, phew. I just realized I had a panicky moment because I'm like, I haven't seen Felix in a long time. Uh oh, but he's around. Okay, we're gonna vote for Felix the cat or someone else. I don't know. Or not Felix the cat. How about that? Now, right, we're going to have some proportion of, of students who say I would vote for Felix the cat, right? But then if I took a, a brand new sample of 100 students, so potentially different, potentially uh, some the same, some overlap. But if I took a brand new sample, I understand that the sample proportion would change, right? The proportion of students who would vote for Felix, which I think is a cute uh, thought, um, right? Would change from sample to sample, okay? And so that's this kind of, problem really it's not a problem it's what statistics is made of but we know that okay my point estimate is only so reliable right i'm expecting the population to look something like it but not necessarily exactly like it so how we quantify how these things vary is by the margin of error which you might have heard if you're kind of uh, reading articles, even kind of um, pretty standard newspaper articles, they'll talk about the margin of error, right? They don't have to be uh, academic papers or anything. Uh, we see margin of error quite a bit. Now that margin of error is kind of that buffer. And so I think of it as this buffer around our point estimate. So just as a, an example, another example of this variability, because everything kind of hinges on the variability. If we randomly sample a thousand adults from each state in the US, would you expect the sample means of their heights to be the same, somewhat different or very different, right? And so, our data set would look something like this. I would have uh, the state and I would have the average height X bar, right? A sample average. And so we might start up here, Washington, Oregon, Idaho. What is Idaho? I-H? No. Uh, I-D? I'll go California. <laughs> if you don't know it, just skip it. 
Do, 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 do. Some states. So I've got a thousand adults randomly sampled from each state, right? Which means that I'm going to have some average for Washington, some average for Oregon, some average for California. Really what I have then is I have in the background, I would have a sample of size a thousand for each of these states, right? But then I've condensed it to just a sample of these averages, right? And so now I have a sample of averages. Do we expect these to be drastically different? No, they're averages, right? And so uh, I, I don't think there's a phenomenon like, oh, people who are from blank state, they're super tall or super short. I don't think so. Even overall, they would kind of hover around the same value, right? Which reasonably would be the population average height. Okay. And so here, this variability, I'll give it away because I think you can handle it, but we'll come back to it. Okay. This distribution of averages is going to follow a normal distribution. Okay. Not that crazy. It's going to be centered on mu, the population mean height. Okay. Some of these states are going to be shorter than the average height and some of them are going to be taller. But if you think about individual heights, we expect more spread, right, than the averages. I would expect these averages to be pretty close to the population average. Okay? And so that's going to be reflected in the margin of error. We expect uh, sample means to be closer to mu. And I guess I need more space. Uh-oh. Slides doing me dirty. Closer to mu than individual heights. So that's that idea. But the key thing is that it's going to follow a normal distribution which is why we spent so much time working on the normal distribution. Okay. You can skim through this. Um, I'm just gonna cherry pick some, some key pieces of information, but this is a, a typical article that you could find in, I don't know, some Boring newspaper, probably. Um, young adults, young, underemployed, and optimistic. A plurality of the public, 41%, uh, believes young adults rather than middle-aged or older adults are having the toughest time in today's economy. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Among all 18 to 34-year-olds, they say fully half, but then followed up with 49%, which just really, I find very irksome. So I changed it to approximately. Having written boring articles like this, uh, that doesn't really fly. So uh, approximately half, 49%, or just less than half, not fully half, that's weird. Say they've taken a job they didn't want just to pay the bills with 24% saying they have taken an unpaid job to gain work experience. So these, these percentages, remember the percentages are probabilities, which are proportions. Okay? So we can analyze these proportions. There's more proportions here, and more than one third say that as a result of the pandemic, they've gone back to school, their personal lives have been affected, blah, blah, blah. These guys, 
this 49% and this 41%, those are point estimates. Point estimate of what for this one? This is a point estimate of the public, so everyone, that believes young adults rather than middle-aged or older adults are having the toughest times in, in today's economy. That's kind of weird, but it's a point estimate of the public opinion. It's our best guess at what the public looks like. This 49% is a point estimate of the 18 to 34 year olds. Now the 18 to 34 year olds are included in the general public, but then if we look at just the 18 to 34 year olds, then the point estimate is bumped up a little bit to 49%. Okay. And this is taking a job so they, uh, they didn't want just to pay the bills, but this here is a point estimate of 18 to 34 year olds. Like we've been saying, okay, if we release these samples and we collected brand new samples, right? I would expect slightly different point estimates not necessarily 41 and not necessarily 49, but if my sample is still representative of the, of the general population, they should hover around there, right? Around those values. So the margin of error, they talk blah, 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 blah. They talk about how they collected the data, right? To outline that it is representative of the population or maybe not, okay. Uh, kind of talked about how they analyze this stuff, which is what you would have to do if you're writing an article like this. And then we end with the margin of sampling error is plus or minus 2.9 percentage points for the results based on the total sample. And then 4.4 percentage points for the 18 to 34 year olds. So we've got a wider spread on those 18 to 34 year olds, right? More variability at the 95% confidence level. For now, 95% confidence is going to be pretty standard, right? That's going to be our default confidence level. Okay, so this is a, a default confidence level. We don't know really what confidence intervals are yet, but that's what we're, we do actually. How? 95 sounds familiar from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. All right, so if I move out to standard deviations, I've covered the central 95, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Right, we just need better spread than the standard deviations. So 41% plus minus 2.9%. So you can go down 2.9, you can go up 2.9. And then we can say that we're 95% confident that 38.1 to 43.9% of the public. Now this is the population, right? of the population right, of the public believes young adults rather than middle-aged or older adults are having the toughest time in today's economy. So we've built these bounds down a little, up a little from our point estimate. Okay? And then what we say is that we're 95% confident that this interval captures that population proportion in this case. 49% plus minus 
right? Of the so this is for the 18 to 34 year olds. So plus minus 2.9% and 4.4% for adults aged 18 to 34. Down 4.4, up 4.4 from 449. So we're 95% confident that 44.6 to 43, uh, 53.4 of 18 to a percent of 18 to 34 year olds taking a job they didn't want just to pay the bills. Okay. So we need this spread in order to communicate some sort of confidence level with our estimate. Okay. And so I'll write that down here. We need the spread, which is really the margin of error, to communicate uh, the confidence interval around our estimate. As an example, thank you. Brand new example, which isn't super obvious. Uh, suppose the proportion of American adults who support the expansion of solar energy is 0.88. Yeah. P is equal to 0.88. Now P is what we're going to use for the population proportion, where P is the population proportion. So now we're pretending to know what the population proportion is, which we never really do, right? We collect samples to try to figure out if our hunch about the population is right or wrong, right? Or supported or not supported. But in this case, let's just briefly pretend that we know this population proportion is 0.88 or 88% if you prefer. This is going to be our parameter of interest, right? Because it's a population proportion, it's a parameter. Is a randomly selected American adult more or less likely to support the expansion of solar energy? So just knowing that overall, the proportion that supports it uh, is 88%. You just randomly pick someone, the probability that they support it is 0.88, which means that they're, uh, a randomly selected person is more likely to support it, right? That's not necessarily true for that individual, right? But we don't get hung up on those details. Um, I'll say more likely since the probability is 0.88, right? More than 50%. Eighty-eight percent is more than fifty percent. So that's what I'm hinging it on. Really, is my internal uh, kind of line in the sand. If it's less than fifty percent, then they're less likely to uh, support it, and if it's more than fifty percent, then they're more likely to support them. Solar energy. So many typos on this thing, and I probably didn't even catch them all, but driving me bonkers. And then I forgot to edit it. Suppose that you don't have access to the population of all American adults, which is definitely uh, very likely. 
then what you would do in order to estimate the proportion of American adult, adults who support solar power expansion, you might get a sample from the population and use your sample proportion as the best guess for this unknown population proportion. And I'm gonna post an Excel assignment that kind of walks you through this, uh, this procedure. So this is our code, you can ignore that and you're gonna have an Excel assignment instead. See Excel assignment instead, which I haven't posted yet because that'd be crazy. So what you're gonna do is you're going to pretend to sample with replacement. So everyone that you've sampled can go back out and potentially be sampled again. It's unlikely that you would resample, but because you've got a huge population, but we're gonna sample with replacement a thousand American adults from the population and then ask them, do you support solar power or not? Yeah. Then you're gonna find the sample proportion, right? How many of these thousand said yes, right? Usually what we do is record as a one, as one, and if they don't record as a zero, To find the sample proportion then, you would add up all of these thousand Americans. If it's a one, then it gets added to the total. If it's a zero, then you just move past it, right? And so then you would have the sample proportion, which I might not even have introduced yet. P hat is the sample proportion feel like I usually have said it at some point, but now it's gonna be a major player for us, okay? So we have P hat is the sample proportion. So a little hat on a P, whereas lowercase P with no hat is the population proportion. Okay? We need to keep those separate because we use the sample proportion to try to learn about the population proportion that we don't actually know. In this kind of illustrative example, we do pretend to know it, but in general, we don't. So the sample proportion is going to be the sum of the records divided by a thousand. because you had a thousand records. Uh -huh. Hey, of the class, I'm assuming las, das. So if each of us went out and did each of these things, right, then we would have, I don't know, two, four, six, let's say 20 sample proportions, right? Same thing as what we saw with the sample means. So what we can do is we can plot the distribution. So make a histogram of the sample proportions. Uh, make a histogram of the sample proportions. Let's pretend that we all did that. Ba, 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 ba. And what we would find is that our sampling distribution might look something like this. Yeah. So you repeat this, right? We do it many, many times. What we see 
is kind of exciting because we know how to work with a normal distribution. What are all the things we know about a normal distribution? We know how to find probabilities with a normal distribution. That's the most important thing, right? Uh, we know how to um, use, so if we have a probability, we can backtrack and work backwards to some sample proportion. But usually how we're going to use this sampling distribution is to find probabilities. If it follows a normal distribution, that's where the 68, 95, 99.7 rule comes in, right? And so we also know how to approximate probabilities uh, and areas under the curve. So that's very exciting to see a normal distribution because we know how that works, okay? What else do we see if we had 0.88 on there, that would be the center, right? And so it would be centered at the population proportion with a little bit of spread. Right? So we see all these population or uh, sample proportions would hover around the population proportion, but with a little bit of spread. Like we said, okay, it looks uh, symmetric, somewhat bell-shaped. I went straight for a normal distribution, that's fine. Based on this distribution, right, the center is at about 0.88, mostly because we forced it to be but then it falls around 0.88. So this idea about the sampling distribution is kind of, uh, kind of lofty. It's this idea because we're never going to see sampling distributions. And so uh, in real world applications, we never actually observe the sampling distribution because it would require us to repeat our sampling many, 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 many times over, right? But it's still working in the background, bless you, and it's how we're going to find probabilities. Okay? And so it will be useful to always think of a point estimate as coming from this hypothetical distribution. So then, of course, understanding the sampling distribution is going to help us kind of make sense of our point estimates. The central limit theorem is the theorem that kind of summarizes what we've established so far. And so it is just as important as it sounds, CLT, central limit theorem, it's usually how I would abbreviate it. And the central limit theorem says this, and the central limit theorem, so we've, we've kind of uh, done a lot of work establishing the idea of the central limit theorem, but ultimately you really only need this next part. Okay. So sample proportions, will be nearly normally distributed with a mean equal to the population proportion, P, and a standard error equal to the square root of P times one minus P over N. We are absolutely not going to talk about why that is, just accept it as fact, okay? And so here, this introduces this new idea of the standard error. The standard error is going to be abbreviated SE. The standard error is different from the standard deviation because like we said, okay, I, I expect some, so I know the standard deviation is spread, but it's the spread of individual observations. 
And then when we talked about, okay, the sample proportions, they're gonna be closer and closer to the population proportion than individual results, right? And that's okay, but that means that we can't use the standard deviation anymore. We have to use something different, a little bit tighter. And so that's why we need the standard error, which is the square root of P times one minus P or Q if you prefer over N. How can we summarize this? P hat follows a, right? Just as a reminder, the tilde means follows a normal distribution with a mean of P and a standard error of the square root of P times one minus P over N. I will add or the square root uh, or the standard error of P hat is the square root of PQ over N. because I, I like to use the Q, saves me uh, some keystrokes, right? I don't need the brackets and I don't need the one minus. It's lazy. But Q is of course one minus P still. Okay. So this is what the central limit theorem says is that, okay, I can assume that P hat, P hat comes from a normal distribution centered on P with a standard error, which behaves the same as the standard deviation of the square root of PQ over M. It wasn't a coincidence that the sampling distribution <clears throat> was symmetric and centered at the true population uh, proportion. Weird, sloppy, yeah. That is the central limit theorem. Uh, and as a fact, that's always going to be how these things behave, assuming some conditions are met, okay? Which we're gonna get to down here. But like I said, we won't go through a detailed proof of why this is the standard error. But one thing to keep in mind is that, okay, if I look at N as my sample size increases, what do I expect? As my sample size increases, then my estimates, my point estimates should get better, right? I've taken up more of the population that I'm trying to learn about. And so then my P hats should start to stabilize, right? Meaning less spread around my population proportions. And so as N increases, uh, samples will yield more consistent P hats, which means that the variability among the P hats will be lower, right? Which means, which is another way of saying that as N increases, the standard error of P hat is going to decrease. You can also look at the formula and say, okay, if I increase N, I'm dividing by a bigger number. And then in the end, I'm taking the square root of a smaller number yielding a smaller number. Or as you've taken more of the population, you expect your point estimates to stabilize around the population proportion. Okay. There are some conditions that we need to check in order for this to be uh, valid, which we've seen before in a way. So in order for the central limit theorem to apply, first thing we have to have is independence, okay? Sampled observations must be independent. Yeah. This can be difficult to verify, but 
it's more likely if we've done random sampling, which is usually how a, a question would start, right? Uh, a random sample of 500 people found that 49 of them found, felt this way or something like that, right? And so usually this, usually stated in the question to collect a random sample and you found this right if it's not stated you have to assume it that's okay right one of the things that we need to kind of get used to is saying okay well one of the conditions that i need Right? I need these conditions to be met. So whether it's stated explicitly or if I have to say, I assume the sample was randomly selected, right? then you can still proceed. And that's kind of weird. We're not used to doing that probably, but uh, it is one of the conditions. And so even if it's not stated, then you have to state, hey, I assume these are, are randomly selected. So it's usually stated, if not uh, stated in the question, we must assume the sample was randomly selected. If we're sampling without replacement, then one of the things, and this one's kind of counterintuitive, we need a sample size less than 10% of the population. I don't tend to put a lot of stock in this one because our questions that we're gonna deal with are curated, right? And so sometimes I skip this one. Sometimes I skip this one, but technically we should be checking it, but what's the problem here? My sample size has to be less than 10% of the population, but we just established that, okay, if I have a big sample, that's good, it stabilizes my, my spread around the population, okay? But in the case of independence, right? If I've collected too much of the population, then you're more likely to have included uh, kind of married couples or siblings or some other thing that makes them not independent for what you're measuring, right? Same household, that kind of thing. And so then we have this problem of taking up too much of the population and then we lose that independence. That's not usually an issue. And so that's why I kind of skip it sometimes. And I just focus on the random sampling. Right? The sample size condition, or sometimes I'll call it the normality condition, There have to be at least 10 expected successes and 10 expected failures in your observed sample. Okay. Expected, it's kind of the, the pickle there. We've seen that before, right? When we said, okay, I've got the binomial distribution, but I can model it with a normal distribution if I have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures, right? And so we're doing the same thing. The expected successes depends on what my population proportion is. Yeah. And so this is difficult to verify if you don't know the population proportion. 
And so this, the expected, uh, depends on the population proportion P. In those cases, if you don't have a population proportion, right, which you most likely won't, unless you've hypothesized one, then you can use it, right? In those cases, we look for the number of observed successes and failures to be at least 10 each. I should clarify that here. So notice the difference between expected successes and failures and observed successes and failures. So when P is unknown, so P is the population proportion, right? then the central limit theorem says that the standard error is going to be the square root of P times one minus P over N with the condition that N P and N times one minus P, right? This is going to be the expected successes. And n times one minus p is the expected failures, or at least 10. So if you have a p, a population proportion p that you can use, cool, just multiply it by n and find the expected successes and then the remainder are failures, okay? However, we often don't know the value of P, which is the population proportion. In these cases, we just take my, my best guess for what P is, P hat, right? And so here P hat is the sample proportion which is my point estimate for P. Or I like to think of it as my best guess at what P is. Our best guess oops, for P. That makes sense. I don't have a P, so I'm going to use my, my best guess, which is my P hat. So then for the condition, what you're going to check is you're going to check that n times p hat, which is the observed successes, has to be greater than or equal to 10. And n times 1 minus p hat, which is n times q hat, right? q is 1 minus p, so q hat. Q hat is one minus P hat. It's whatever the P is, one minus P. So N times Q hat, which is the observed failures has to be greater than or equal to 10. Might be too much to take in now, but I'll say it anyways. This is the condition that we're going to check if we're building a confidence interval. Whereas if we're doing a hypothesis test, we're going to have a hypothesized value for P and then that's when we would use it. Okay. And so, but I'll, maybe that was too much. For now, it's okay. Yeah. I haven't checked in in a while. Any questions? <laughs> Hopefully you would just ask. No. Okay. So 
what happens when these sample sizes are too small? Then we're kind of hooped and it's not a situation I would put you in. Uh, and so they're always going to pass, right? But it's your job to know to check the conditions. Yeah. So suppose we have a population where the true population proportion is 0 0.05, very small, right? 5%. And we take a random sample of 50 from this population. What we would find is that if I take n times p, 50 times 0 0.05, I get two and a half, right? Which means that I would only expect two and a half successes, which is not enough for the normal distribution to apply. And the reason is because it looks it would look more like this, right? Centered around 0 0.05, but we don't have enough successes and failures uh, to kind of make it symmetric. Okay. And so this isn't gonna happen, right? You still need to check the conditions, they'll always pass, but this is the reason we can't use it because we don't have we don't have the methods uh, to analyze that distribution. We only have methods to analyze a normal distribution, which applies in most cases anyways, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, notice that this is a really small probability of success, right? Which if we take a step back and we're trying to detect something rare, would you just collect a, a sample of a hundred things? No, right? That doesn't make sense. Our intuition is, well, I probably wouldn't capture it if I just collected a hundred people. If I'm looking for this rare disease, for example, right? Intuitively, we would say, oh, I, I would probably need to capture more of the population to be able to detect enough of those cases, right? Same thing with, um, with uh, kind of bankruptcies and things like that. It sounds like they're super common, but in the grand scheme of, of financial data, they're very uncommon, right? And so to be able to pick those up, you need to have a huge sample size in order to, um, to pick up on those. Yeah. Which if we take a step back and think about it, makes sense but we get lost in the weeds with this NP times N one minus P. But really all we're saying is, is my sample size big enough to be able to detect this proportion that I'm trying to detect? What we're gonna find is the closer your P is to 0.5, right? 50-50 split, then the smaller sample size you need in order to get to that normal distribution. In fact, if the probability is 0.5, even at a sample of size 10, we have basically a normal distribution already, right? If we have a small probability, it takes us a little bit longer, kind of 25, 50 to reach that normal distribution, right? And so the closer we are to 0.5, the quicker we're going to move towards that normal distribution. Right. Uh, when the conditions are not met, when either n times p or n times one minus p is small, right, then the distribution is more discrete, which we saw here, right? Point one, we've got this kind of stilty looking thing. It's not very helpful and not very important either. Uh, when n times p or uh, n times one minus p is less than 10, then we get this more skewed distribution, right? So if we don't have enough successes and failures, to capture enough of 10 of each, right? Then we get the skewed distribution in either direction. But then as we increase, it gets more normal. 
which is the next point. Um, when n p and n minus p or n times one minus p are both very large, then the distribution looks much more like a normal distribution, which is really the takeaway. What's really neat is the central limit theorem applies to other distributions as well, okay? So the strategy of using a sample statistic to estimate a parameter is very common. It's all of inference. Okay? And so we can use this strategy and the central limit theorem um, and the central limit theorem, which apply to other statistics besides a proportion. We're gonna start with proportions, one sample proportions in fact, and then we're gonna build out to means. But sometimes our, our understanding of averages is a little bit more intuitive. Okay? So if we take a random sample of students at a college and ask them how many extracurricular activities you're involved in, to estimate the average number of extracurricular activities all students in the college are interested in, right? then we understand that if I took a, a new random sample, I would find a slightly different average and I would build up this sample, sampling distribution of averages. Okay. But they would center on the population mean, just like the population proportion from before. Looking at the formula sheet, I snagged it already. I do include the central limit theorem, but this is really just theoretical, so you can ignore it. Yeah. And so p hat follows a normal distribution centered on p with a standard error of the square root of p q over n. Right. And so here, P times one minus P over N if you want, which is the same thing as P times Q over N. So you can ignore it if you want to, right? But that's the sampling distribution. As we kind of grow as statisticians, all you're really going to need is the sampling distribution. Right? Because then you know what the point estimate is, you know where it's centered, you know what the shape of the distribution is, and you know how to figure out what the spread is. We're not quite there yet, right? So for now, you can ignore it if you want. Okay. Let me see if I think, yeah, we are where I think we are. And can I trust that clock? I don't know. I can. Sort of. Can't really tell. From here, I have more time than I think I actually do. So good to know. Okay. In 5.2, and then 5.3, and then the sample size. I hold off until 6.1 to do, although I'll kind of talk about it maybe today a little bit. Okay. It's just a fun thing. It's not terribly important. So confidence interval. If we just break this down, it's a confidence interval for P. Um, 
Sure, I'll put it here. I'm trying to capture the population proportion. What am I going to do? I'm trying to capture the population proportion. Now, remember, the population proportion is this fixed thing that we don't know. So it's not moving around or anything. We're just trying to uh, capture it blindly with this interval. Okay? And so that's kind of a uh, trying to capture the population proportion, which is a fixed value. This is going to be really important to kind of have a handle on. If you were to collect the entire population, the population proportion would just be one thing, just one value, right? But we don't have that one thing, so we're going to try to capture it with a confidence interval. P hat is my sample proportion. That's going to be my point estimate. So my point estimate is P hat. Oops, my point estimate is P hat. And in this case, P hat is the sample proportion. I'm gonna try to use my sample proportion to try to capture the population proportion. But I need to build some bounds just like we saw before. Okay. Now for now, Z star is going to be what determines how many standard errors I want to move out, right? So it's really going to communicate the confidence level of our interval. <clears throat> So here, uh, Z star is how we change the confidence level of our interval. Thinking about, here I'm centered on P. I don't know what P is, but I am allowed to assume as long as my sample size is big enough that my P hats hover around here, right? So my P hat is going to be somewhere in this distribution here. Now, what we said before, was that a 95% confidence interval is going to be kind of the default. We'll be able to make 90% confidence intervals, 99% confidence intervals, All right? Technically, what would you need to do? If you want to make an interval, you want the central 95%, for example, right? So then there is some Z value, so some standardized value that's going to capture the negative version to the positive version that's going to capture the central 95%. We already know how to do that, right? In fact, uh, in our tables, where is it? I'm gonna copy this little guy. Whoa, where was I? Here. We know, uh oh, still pasting, um, that the central 95% is roughly captured by plus minus two standard deviations. <laughs> 
now we don't have standard deviations. We have standard errors, but they behave the same way from the normal distribution. And so it's still pasting. That is super annoying. Um, so if I go down to standard errors and up to standard errors, I've captured the central 95%. We're gonna be a little bit more precise and we're going to use what we've seen before, right? 1.96 as our Z star for a 95% confidence level. We haven't really used these intervals or these uh, confidence levels yet very much, but we know how it behaves, right? And so here, Z star is going to be 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval, which means you're gonna go down 1.96 standard errors and then up 1.96 standard errors, leaving 0.025 in each tail, right? Which is also how you could kind of backtrack to that Z star. So for a 95% confidence level, Z star is 1.960 or close, close to two. 1.96 is, I would argue, close to two. But we want to use that more precise value just because we can. So this Z star is how we change the confidence level. Right. If you go out further, right, if you make a wider interval, then you can be more confident, right? I'm very confident that this interval captures my uh, population proportion. The problem is you don't want to go too wide because if you ask me, hey, Emily, how far is it to your house? And I, so I live kind of downtown there. I would say, oh, it's about four kilometers plus minus a hundred kilometers. You'd say, well, thanks so much. And then you would say, oh, how confident are you? I, I would say, oh, I'm a hundred percent confident that that interval has captured the true distance to my house. That's not very useful. So there's this trade-off between confidence, right? I can be 100% confident if I just make huge bounds and precision, right? Where it actually tells us something about what the population looks like. And so that's what this 95% is about. It's this trade-off where we get a, a really good confidence and just not overblown bounds. Okay? But we can adjust your confidence level Right, uh, 90 is pretty common, 95, 98, 99. I will only ask you to build confidence intervals that are on here, okay? So don't worry, you're safe. Okay? But it will be one of those on the table. Okay? Same table, different use. Okay? Then this, going back to our formula here, this is the standard error, right, of p hat. What color haven't I used here? Maybe I'll use green again. This is the standard error of the point estimate, which is p hat in this case, which is going to take the place of the standard deviation right, which is the spread of the point estimate. So if I move out two standard errors in either direction around my point estimate, then I have built a 95% confidence interval or let's say 1.96 standard errors. Okay. And then of course the plus minus 
comes from the negative and the positive because I have to move out in either direction. We write intervals We write the confidence interval as round bracket, lower, comma, upper, round bracket. Or if you prefer the math, p hat minus z star times the square root of p hat q hat over n up to p hat plus z star times the square root of p hat q hat over n. Oops. I guess we didn't talk about this move explicitly where the standard error instead of from the formula sheet here, technically it should be the square root of PQ over N, but we don't have P, so then we don't have Q. And so then we use our best guess at what it is instead, which is P hat. So that's how it changed to P hat Q hat in here. But it is the standard error. It's just changed to something that we have. I kind of want to outline all the things and then we'll kind of take it back with the um, with some examples. But the last thing I want to do, so a confidence interval is just going to be from a number to a number, just math, nothing crazy. Half of the work though is going to be interpreting the interval. Okay. And so maybe I'll put a page here. Once we have calculated the confidence interval, from some lower value to some upper value, round brackets around those, we need to interpret the interval. We need to interpret the interval, which is usually half the marks. So uh, for me, a confidence interval question is worth four marks, two marks for your math, and two marks for your interpretation. Yeah. What's nice is the interpretation of all confidence intervals will always be the same. So this is where we kind of start, okay, learning how to interpret any confidence interval um, starts now. Um, all confidence intervals are interpreted the same. I know memorization is not that fun, but it is one of those things where I would just tell you to memorize this interpretation until it makes sense. Okay? Don't try to go rogue. It's totally fine if I just see this exact blurb on your test. I won't get mad. I'll get glad. You just use this exact wording, which is... We are some percentage, usually 95. So I'll use a different color here. 95% confident. The interval from blank, so from the lower bound, whatever you found that to be, to blank which will be your upper, 
don't mix those up. There is no interval from the upper bound to the lower bound, right? We're always moving left to right. From blank to blank captures. That's an important word here. Yeah. Because remember the, the population proportion is fixed, right? So we're only 95% confident that the this kind of net that we've thrown out is capturing the population proportion. Okay. We're relying on our pop or our sample proportion to be representative of the population and close enough to the population proportion, but we don't know any of those things. And so that's why we're only 95% confident that we're capturing captures the true which is really just another way of saying population. The true, and then whatever the parameter is. So there are a couple of different ways that you could reword that and keep the same meaning, but there are a lot of ways that you could kind of uh, botch it. So I would stick to this one until it makes sense and until it's stuck. And then maybe just keep using it. I don't know. How about a little example? I'll just make up some numbers. Uh, or maybe not, because I'm sure that there is an example coming up and I don't need to write it out. But this blurb will apply to all confidence intervals that we build. So even though it is a total grind to learn now, we're going to use it in chapter five, in chapter six, in chapter seven. We could even use it in chapter eight if we wanted to get crazy. Okay. And so it applies all the time. So it's worth memorizing. And that's really all there is to it. Okay. This says true. It doesn't actually, but it's supposed to say true. Or population if you prefer. Okay. Any questions before we, so I did kind of a, a run through of the whole thing and then we'll kind of backtrack and introduce the concepts um, here. Confidence intervals for a proportion. Now for us, the type of question, like I said, Determining the type of question that we have uh, is going to be a huge part of answering the question. It's, I would say, the hardest part is reading all these different types of questions and figuring out what type of question I have. So for us, this I'm going to call this a one sample proportion type of question. So taking it way back, confidence intervals is a plausible range of values for this population parameter, right? And it's called the confidence interval. So using only a sample statistic or a point estimate, because we have that terminology already, to estimate a parameter is like fishing in a murky lake with a spear, which is kind of a cute thought, or I guess not, you're fishing. Um, but we don't know what the population parameter is, population proportion in this case. Uh, and so you're just trying to stab it, right? And then using a confidence interval is like fishing with a net, right? We just put some bounds on there and we're, we're still trying to capture this population proportion. So if we report a point estimate, we understand that we probably won't hit the exact population parameter, right? 
But then if we report this interval, then we have a pretty good uh, idea of what the parameter looks like. Okay. Do I have to read this whole thing? I guess all blah, 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 some stuff. But most commercial websites collect data about their users' behavior and use these data to deliver targeted content, recommendations, and ads, which I tend to use to my advantage. Like if I want it to pop up with something, I just say it into my phone a few times. Uh, to understand whether Americans think their lives line up with how the algorithm-driven classification systems categorize them, Pew Research, which is a, a famous research firm, uh, asked a representative sample of 850 American Facebook users how accurately they feel the list of categories Facebook has listed for them on their page, uh, on the page of their supposed interests actually represents them and their interests. Holy run on sentence. 67% of the respondents said that the listed categories were accurate. Estimate the true proportion of American Facebook users who think the Facebook <laughs> categorizes their interests accurately. Man, they're so good in the beginning and then the slides just get weird. Um, okay, so a lot of stuff here, all right? First off, let's highlight one of the main things that jumped out at me is that we have a, re a representative sample. So we're told it's representative, right? So we can assume that they were randomly selected. Okay. Of 850 American Facebook users, N is 850. randomly selected yeah. and then we're told that 67 percent of the respondents yeah. of the respondents is a sample proportion right and so p hat is 0.67 And I'm going to change this to be more clear because we've already introduced the concepts. And so it would say construct a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of American Facebook users who think the Facebook categorizes their interests accurately. Let's ditch the although it's fun. Notice how little information we actually need. So there's a huge blurb, right? But we're not actually given a lot of information and we don't need any more information than this, All right? So if we go and I'm, the slides kind of walk us through it, but I'm just gonna add, add a page here. And can I? Get some lines on here. I'm just going to try to disconnect, add some lines here. For some reason, it will not do it when it's connected. But I'm going to need some lines. Lines. Uh, okay, so let's outline what we've been given. So we've been given N is 850 and P hat is 0.67 usually reported as a percentage, but we need to bring it down to a decimal. 
And then we want a 95% confidence interval. And we want a 95% CI, I'm going to say confidence interval. But from here on out, I'll define it confidence interval. But we can just abbreviate it CI. Confidential informant. Oh. That's really all we've been given, right? But that's all I need in order to determine what type of question it is. Well, I need to make a confidence interval. And yes, confidence interval questions will be this explicit. Construct a 95% or a 90% or a 99% confidence interval for this thing, okay? So it will be that explicit if, it, if you're kind of stuck figuring out what to do, uh, then it's probably a hypothesis test, which we haven't started yet. Huh? Okay. Now, we need to check the conditions before we can go ahead and do the work. The work is kind of uh, new to us, so we'll hold off a little bit, but let's check the conditions. First, we need to check independence, the independence condition. So there's kind of two subgroups for the conditions, independence. We were told that it was a, a representative sample, which means we can assume it was randomly selected. We can assume the sample was randomly selected since it says it is representative. Is 850 Americans less than 10% of the population of Americans, so the N less than 10% condition. Again, we just kind of uh, talk our way through. We can assume 850 Americans is less than 10% of all Americans. N equal to 850. I think it's American Facebook users, but still. American Facebook users is less than 10% of all US Facebook users getting lazy. So that's the independence condition, which just kind of talk your way through it. The normality condition though is going to look like this. Uh, observed successes oops, which is n times p hat. I have n and I have p hat. 850 times 0.67, which I don't know. I have 569.5. That's probably not the observed successes. What probably happened here? Well, when we were given the 0.67, they probably rounded, right? That's okay. This is greater than 10, so that's good. N times Q hat, 
is 850 times one minus 0.67 or 850 minus 569.5 should give you the same answer. And I get 280.5, which is still greater than or equal to 10. Later, the observed successes can be denoted by a capital X. And the observed failures can be denoted by N minus X. if you prefer. Depends on what information you'd have. Sometimes, instead of giving you p hat, I would tell you uh, 550 of these respondents felt that Facebook had categorized their interests appropriately, right? And then you can solve for p hat. So here, Notice that p hat is x over n, where x is the number of successes. Uh, OK. We've checked the conditions. They all check out. Therefore, conditions are satisfied. Now we can do our work. P hat plus minus Z star times the square root of P hat Q hat over N. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, sorry. I, there. P hat is capital X over N. Nice. It's only because I can feel time breathing down my neck. Okay. We need Z star, right? Otherwise, even though we were given very limited information, right? We have N and we have P hat, essentially. And then we're asked to build a confidence interval. So I have P hat. I have P hat, which means I have Q hat, 1 minus P hat. <laughs> And I have n, so I have all the things that I need. It's just the z star for a 95% confidence interval. Let's see if it's still here. I'm trying to paste. Try to keep it on here, but not huge. I'll zoom in instead. Z star for a 95% confidence interval, Z star is 1.960. Now we have all the components that we need. 0.67 plus minus 1.960 times the square root of 0.67 times 1 minus 0.67 divided by 850. Just be careful that you solve the what's inside the square root and then don't forget to take the square root and then multiply by 1.96. 0.67 times 1 minus 0.67. Divided by 850 is really small, so I'm going to take the square root. So this is going to be 0.67 plus minus 1.96 times 0 0.016128161316. Multiply that by 1.96, and I get point zero three one six one 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 nine nine eight
which let's round to definitely more than two decimal places. Let's go to four decimal places, right? Because here you have two, let's go out a little bit more and it makes more sense, 67 point and then two decimal places, that might be nice. So then 0.67 plus minus 0 0.0316 to four decimal places to write our interval. Make sure you do 0 0.67 minus 0 0.0316. So 0 0.67 minus 0 0.0316. I get oops, 0 0.6384 up to 0 0.67 plus 0 0.0316 up to 0 0.7016. We're gonna do it. This is the 95% confidence interval. Notice that we've gone down a little from 67 and up a little from 67 if we convert these to decimals or to percentages, right? And so here, or as percentages, 63.84% up to, oops, 70.16%, oops. Whichever you prefer. If you're using percentages, you have to say percentages. If you're using proportions, you have to say proportions, right? Because now what's the next thing we have to do? We have to interpret the interval we are 95% confident the interval the interval from, I'll use the proportions 0 0.6384 to 0 0.7016 captures, and then we said the true parameter, but usually it's in the question way back here. The question, which I rephrased to be, construct a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of American Facebook users who think Facebook categorizes their interests accurately. That is the parameter that we're trying to figure out what it is. So now, and maybe I'll snag this whole thing, copy captures, and then it's just a, a copy paste scenario, captures the true proportion of American Facebook users who think Facebook categorizes their interests accurately. Sounds fancy, but you're just kind of copying and pasting at that point. Right? Awesome. Hey, we'll review confidence intervals, obviously on Thursday, but we'll pick up there. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise I'll see you on Thursday.